Oh my gosh, are you guys are excited like I am? Ah, let's get to it. It's more than a statement. It's a way of life. Celebration. The Miss Jason talking. <laughs> hey guys, so let me say shout out to my boy Chris and D Taylor. Okay. Uh, they reminded me that before we got our popcorn, you know what I'm saying, get our virtual movie ticket at like it's 1991, there's still something from 1990 we gotta see. I saw a bit and a part of it, but it's very important to the journey. Omnibus UK TV special. Uh, we're gonna check out part one and depending on the length, maybe part two. All right, let's go. And sex in an interview which at her request was filmed in black and white. Interesting. So Madonna wanted this film black and white. Hmm. What was this all about? Does uh anybody know? Is she like really into that kind of like cinematography, or is she think she looked better in black and white? Like, what's going on? Drop the comments below. <laughs> this sounds scary. <laughs> Like, if I was watching that night time of Ray, I'm about to have some nightmares or something. <laughs> like, what? Ancient artifacts? <laughs> I had a dream. I wanted to be a big star. I wanted to make people happy. I wanted to be famous. I wanted everybody to love me. I worked really hard and my dream came true. Shout out to that version too. I'm like, stop. See, I'm like geeking out about Madonna. Now. That's crazy. But I know the journey, right? The version tour, what's up? It's still got a special place in my heart. Okay, let's go. to be worshipped in the door. Feels great. <laughs> yes, I've always wanted to be famous. Just for the really obvious reasons. I mean, people want to be famous because they want to be loved. And I guess somewhere along the line when I was a little girl, I didn't feel loved. So um, I sort of made it my goal in life to be loved by many people. And okay, so she got that look filler in, right? Okay, I she kind of like this look okay let's go and i think most performers have that somewhere deep down inside of them that they need to get a lot of approval and a lot of attention that's where it starts now i mean what you end up doing with your fame and fortune or whatever is another story you know i think i didn't realize what that being famous was going to be such a responsibility and that every thing i said or did was going to be scrutinized and and that I was going to be such a role model and that I had, you know what I mean? And so once that happens, then you start realizing that everything you say is really important and that, and that what you say affects people. So I think you have to either take that responsibility and use it in a positive way or get out of the limelight. Donna Louise Chacon. Mm, this is actually kind of like a prolific statement. And uh, I wonder, like, in the age of social media, you know, even on my platform, which is by, like, no means, like, on the scale of, Madonna or anything like that, but still, like, I feel like, you know, I always want to put positivity out there, and I am always mindful and careful what I say, because, you know, you are, uh, like, you know, you are being exposed to people you don't even know, um, and you don't know really how large, um, of a following that you may have, and again, like, how your words simply impact and affect someone's day so she's right about that like i really do hate when celebrities say like oh you know i'm not a role model but you are like you put yourself in that position and at the end of the day 
I think there is some kind of social responsibility because you just have this a mass of followers. And what do followers do typically, right? They follow the leader. <laughs> hey, let's go. He was born in Bay City, Michigan in 1958. The girl was only six when her mom died of cancer. That left half a dozen kids to be brought up by their strict Italian-American dad. He put them in a neighborhood Catholic school run by nuns. The discipline seemed... I went to Catholic schools, I went to church every Sunday, I got hit on the head with rulers by hostile nuns. Um, <laughs> um, I did a lot of bad things and I didn't feel guilty about it because I knew I could go to confession at the end of the week and I would be forgiven. I thought the devil was in the basement of my house. Um, my Catholic upbringing is probably the foundation of everything I do right now. Here we see Christ as the judge, the judge of mankind, looking down on us. In the Catholic Church, traditionally, you are a sinner. I mean, basically, I mean, the idea is, is that when, when Adam and Eve, you know, ate from the apple or had sex, um, from that day on, they were considered sinners, and and all human beings are considered sinners, and so you're always striving to be good. Hmm, I think it's interesting that she uh, vocally said had sex, right? That's interesting. All right, let's go. <laughs> Madonna came into my class as a junior, and she sat right in front of me, and I focused completely on her, and she engaged me, and then later that engagement intensified. This is a photograph that she gave to me when she graduated high school. Mrs. Fellows, I cannot begin to tell you how I feel about you and how I shall always treasure your words of encouragement. Sometimes I think you might explode with so much energy inside of you. I think you're crazy and I'm madly in love with your craziness and of course you, Madonna. <laughs> If I was a teacher, I would want my uh, students to write me kind of notes like that. Like, kids don't even write, right? Like, uh, people don't even write anymore. But anyway. <laughs> no one was surprised that Madonna made it. And that seems strange because this is a remote suburban community outside of Detroit. And the likelihood of somebody becoming famous, certainly as famous as Madonna, is really very remote. And yet there was such a quality of charisma about her personality that when this dream came true, we simply accepted it. Madonna has said, when I was tiny, my grandmother used to beg me not to go with men, to love Jesus and be a good girl. I grew up with two images of women, the virgin and the whore. It was a little scary. Is that little Madonna? <laughs> has often said that throughout her life she has felt different from what others have expected her to feel or to be. In videos, she often plays two roles, one questioning the other, for example, in Like a Virgin. Singing in an overtly sexual way and mixing in her dress the lace gloves of the bordello with the crucifix. She makes a mockery of her grandmother's and the church's view that women are either virgins or whores. I think the Madonna is probably the most powerful image from Catholicism or Christianity. I suppose it's the image of a mother, you know. because of that, a very important one. It was my mother's name. I don't know why my grandmother named my mother that. Now when I see the name printed somewhere, I have to check and make, and see if it's about my <laughs> sister or the original Madonna. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> Someone named Madonna is, is inherently uh, going to be controversial, but maybe the most important part of her controversy is the fact that Madonna is almost a religion, that she's almost a religious figure herself, uh, that she's sort of a kind of saintly figure for a lot of people, and, and that people who are part of an established religion might find that threatening. 
All right, so right off of it, what am I noticing about this school, this community? Ah, little to no diversity, okay? But <laughs> let's go. I mean, it's hard to have a religion based on dead heroes when you have live heroes around who are, you know, taking away your customers. Madonna draws on her own background, the use of Catholic iconography, and in, in her own modestly immodest way, she has seized back the crucifix for the masses, you know. They do not belong to John Paul II. They do not belong to any particular sect. They belong to all of us. Whether she meant to do that or not, it's had that effect. Suddenly, the crucifix as a fashion icon is something that caught people's imaginations, partly because they want something to believe in other than, you know, a Coca-Cola logo. Religion plays, you know, a really big part in my work. I'm really fascinated by religious imagery. I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I'm still very curious about Catholicism and, and religion in general, not just Catholicism. The things that inspire you are mysterious things, and there's something very mysterious about the church to us. Um, and uh, it's exploring those things which make it interesting. It's just about what we know, and using those images to evoke feelings that everyone has. There's quite a lot of this is an absolute top eight. And I love like that little interview I saw with Donna and she gave that this game and like, yo, listen, this might not that this not necessarily my religious belief. I'm just a part of the show, okay? <laughs> Someone said to me the other day, you, I, you lit a fire under her, and I said, no, darling, I lit lots of fires, but her kindling was just in the right place. It took off. Well, you know, what fun she was, always that, what fun. And it's the kind of fun I like because it does not deny responsibility or deny seriousness or deny classicism, things that the love of what we were doing was all about. When I met Christopher Flynn, my whole life changed. It wasn't just because dancing, studying dance with him gave me a focus which is really important and took me sort of out of what I consider to be a very humdrum existence. But he taught me about art and classical music and took me to museums and he also took me out to my first gate discotheque and I just saw a different side of life that I had never seen before. She loved to dance, period which is one of the things I admire very much. I like people who love to dance even more they, than they want to be ballet dancers. And she would clear the floor and we'd just start cutting loose and everybody loved her. And not because she was showing off. It's just that she could, she so thoroughly enjoyed dancing that it just sprung out of her. You know who's more successful than this woman that i find very difficult to relate to i go you know she's got all these zillions and billions of dollars or something whatever and that she can't move across this room without being deluged by people etc where's my little madonna <laughs> madonna She was very young, she was barely out of adolescence, plain little child, 
with a short kind of, what would we say, dishwater blonde hair, you know, nothing special. Uh, she had a doll that was oh, probably two, and, two feet long, little girl doll, you know, a little dress and so forth, stuck onto her arm. Looked just like the... What, Donna walking around with a little doll? I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine it. I know back in 1977, nobody first saw like, whoa, this girl. I feel like not even 1983, not even 1984. I don't feel like essentially until 1990, folks really took Madonna seri seriously as a force to be reckoned with, right? I think like by 84, it's like, okay, ooh, this girl, like, you know, basically almost like, uh, you know, clout. Well, not necessarily clout change, I'll say like hype beats, you know what I mean? Like, oh, okay, 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 boom, she's just doing some trendiness on the end. Uh, just like rap, people thought she was just a fad that was going to get washed away, but it didn't happen like that, right? <laughs> the most innocent child in the world. Christopher Flynn was the first person that told me I was beautiful and that told me I was special and that made me look at myself in a in a different way. Yo, for real, I'm like, I remember my mom used to always tell me as a child and I was little, like, you know, everybody's story begins at home and the more that I grow older, the more I realize what my mom meant by that. Like literally any issues or insecurities that people have typically start in childhood. Like it's crazy, right? I think I was 14 years old and I was feeling horribly unattractive and unpopular and uninteresting and unfabulous. <laughs> and he said, God, you're beautiful. And I mean, I don't think anyone ever said that to me before. And I said, what? You know, and he, he just, he made me appreciate beauty, but not in a conventional way, you know, like really about um, spirit and, and soul. It was becoming apparent that she was moving into a different direction and academic dance is academic dance. That's all I can say about it. It can be thrilling and exciting in its own ways, but it has its limitations. <laughs> And it was also necessary for her to explore lots of other things. She headed to New York, and I hear she asked the first cab driver to take her to the middle of things or whatever. He took her to Times Square. <laughs> Wonderful. That cab driver has a real sense. Yeah, listen, I'm going to tell y'all this, right? Even though we not nowhere, even halfway in the end of the journey, I feel like borderline going to always stay in my top 10. It's just something about that, those keys that ding, 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 ding. It's just something about those keys that it's just always going to make you smile, right? That ding, 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 ding. ding. Just teasing already, right? Borderline make you just feel like happy. Okay, anyway, let's go. <laughs> That's a good one. That's all I can say. She had 70, 75 dollars, something like that in her pocket. She had a doll under her arm, a little satchel of some sort. And <laughs> I'm sure the most wide open, encompassing, vulnerable look in the world. Nothing like that kind of young adult angst from Madonna, right? <laughs> Obviously the taxi driver didn't really know where it was all happening because he wouldn't have taken her to Times Square. But uh, Times Square is really disgusting. I'm sure it was really horrible, you know, uh, with that much money in your pocket. We were both still relatively poor, you know, and living in not such great places, you know, in the Lower East Side, uh, between the A and B Avenue, living on Pop. Oh, so Chris had come up by then. Interesting. All right. Um, this had to be like when was she split up with the Breakfast Club, Crispa came up. All right, let's go. Born and tuna fish, you know, just real basic, basic living with cockroaches and not much heat in the winter, that sort of thing. It was pretty disgusting. <laughs> but I think we had some fun, you know. She was starting to perform in clubs and uh, what we called track dates. 
So we were making money doing that, and I was dancing with her. And she was developing a following here in the city, which obviously means a lot to somebody who came here with $35 and her ballet slippers. It's on steel. every bit the superstar even then um, even though she was nothing she uh, tested her microphone from every angle to the point that the club had to open before my group got to have a sound check at all and then after we did our opening act she wouldn't let us share the dressing room with her her manager said we had to leave Madonna was getting dressed even though there was only that one dressing room for all of us and we insisted on staying anyway but I thought who was her manager at that time? Was it Camille? Okay, ooh, this girl got that Madonna history. Let's go! <laughs> this girl's not going to go anywhere. She's a major bitch. Dang. She's going to offend so many people, and she's going nowhere fast. And I was right. <laughs> hey, show the <laughs> She had written 14 songs by then. And to me, that was Boy. really impressive because I, I, I had a lot of training, but by then I hadn't really, I still hadn't written one song. So I thought, well, this is, this is great. If, if a person can come from dance school and decide to be a songwriter and become a songwriter merely by volition, then I think I can do that too. Like, look how she just inspired the people around her, right? Look at Steve, look at her brother, Christopher, okay? Like, again, you just never know how you and your own life just be inspiring folks around you. Discovered Madonna at Danceteria. The DJ there yes, told me about her. He had met her before I did and told me about this uh, wild looking girl, had a, her own look, was very beautiful and had a tape, which was good. It wasn't outstanding, but I had Madonna sitting in my office. There was this girl that was just radiating. And whatever that certain something is, she had it. She had more That's of it than I've ever seen. And I just knew that there was a star just sitting here in my office. And I turned to her and I said, so what do you want to do? She said, I want to make records. I said, okay. Suddenly, there she was, having once been a kind of street and ethnic, you now in the midst of, of Hollywood and, and theater, blondness and style. Mm. But she talking about that early switch up, right? That early switch up. And again, which is so interesting, if uh, you were just now getting onto my journey again, I suggest you go back and watch the beginning videos. Uh, I always laugh at this whole thing where, again, that first album, uh, a lot of the songs like Everybody, um, Lucky Star, specifically Lucky Star and Holiday, uh, where people will say like, oh yeah, like I thought Madonna was like black or like Puerto Rican or something, right? Like people's like, they didn't think Madonna was white. And um, a lot they had to do, from my understanding, was like the marketing and how, kind of the old school marketing, really, how they didn't show her face on uh, those early, I guess, singles, uh, which is interesting, right? But uh, yeah, again, like, it is so interesting to me um, as well. Like, again, you to me, True Blue is like that pinnacle of Madonna kind of like uh, turning her back on the streets, right? That ethnic roots that whole album right but you get the imagery uh where you hear it or you get the imagery where you still like see the the street in her um and a lot of those videos from that particular era i mean even here right when madonna's not playing Marilyn, you know she still has that kind of spunky attitude as she's called up her friend like yeah he sent me diamonds <laughs> you know you know what i mean so ah, was, ah. again uh, this Madonna journey is always interesting. Uh, I've been thoroughly entertained all the way. And uh, again, much respect has been earned for me throughout this whole journey. I think people just assumed that she was stupid and superficial when she first emerged. You know, because she was a young, um, sexy thing. You know, um, a young girl. Then it turned out that she wasn't. You know, that she had a great deal of say and control over this persona that was clearly developing and in a, you know, in an intelligent, shrewd way. Uh, that you really, you could look at her and she was mysterious. She was okay. Oh. Oh. Still don't like this song either. <laughs> Madonna has often said in interviews that she has a deep sense of guilt and a feeling that she will be punished. She sometimes links this guilt to her mother's death. Whatever the origins of Madonna's feelings about guilt and punishment may be, 
Her lyrics and her videos show a preoccupation with punishment and with images that fuse sex and aggression. I think I spent a lot of years hating my father when I first moved away from home for like forcing me, for being such a disciplinarian and forcing me to go to church and wear a dress all the time. But um, I guess the older I get, the closer I feel to him. It's a, a odd thing, right, isn't it? Like most people experience like, ah, uh, like I hate, like you hate any kind of authority, right? As a child, you're like, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. But then like you grow older, and uh, you respect that authority. Like, I know some people who, now looking back, right, like, they were kind of cool in the sense of they could, like, stay out all night and do whatever they wanted to do as teenagers. But now as adults, they, like, say, like, oh, man, I wish I had somebody tell me no. You know what I mean? So I find that's always interesting uh, with, you know, adolescents as they grow up. And the more accepting I am of his, what I consider to be his shortcomings, learning experience to deal with my fears to deal with my past to deal with my life and express myself through my work and I mean let's face it it's not a hundred percent autobiographical I draw from things that have happened to me so what's interesting I don't think I caught this when I was watching her father is that it looked like Madonna all the roots had barely came back out right her hair is really dark for the most part like she was about to Go ahead and go back to being dark again, right? But uh, Dick Tracy came. <laughs> the press treatment of Madonna has always followed her lead. Think about the nude photo flap. Remember that? When both Playboy and Penthouse discovered that Madonna had posed for nude pictures way back in, I don't know, 79, 80, something. And they bought the rights to these pictures and they like you know, stuck them in their magazines and they tremendous publicity. Well, now, this sort of thing has been happening to women in the entertainment business for hundreds of years. It happened to Louise Brooks. It happened to Marilyn Monroe. It's always been a scandal, and people try and suppress the pictures and say, oh, I was so poor. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand what I was... He, he talked me out of my clothes. But does. It's, what's the big deal? But I learned, again, check out this documentary. It's called, uh, what is it, like, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn Re -re Revisited or something like that. And uh, it was on CNN, and it was so detailed, um, mostly. And again, Marilyn wasn't, like, cowering, like, oh, my gosh, no, Marilyn was the first to say, I'm not ashamed, like, boom. And um, just when, um, what's that, uh, gentlemen prefer bloods, like, came out, she's like, oh, so what? Boom, I did it. <laughs> so Marilyn's the original gangster with that. All right, let's go. Right, guys so we just watched part one we're gonna come back and watch part two uh, a little later uh y'all drop those comments below like boom what y'all think about what y'all saw so far do y'all even remember this coming on tv did this come on like in america which is on the bbc or something drop those comments below uh so if you haven't already make sure you subscribe to my channel if you are subscribed make sure you join the channel and you like a to yet to sort of your choice you know what to do hit me about patreon the link is below all right guys i'll see you next time <laughs>